just got a background in, did you study biology? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, Squessa work on scientific visualization, but from a kind of artistic creative perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really generous of Nikki to come and give her time to talk to us. So thank you, Nikki. And we're really looking forward to what you've got to say. Thank so you. welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here and to check out your space as well. It looks like you've got lots of exciting things happening here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about how we help scientists to sort of innovate their research engagement um, using digital art and science. So obviously we're not the first um, people to do this, but um, we're trying to make it sort of more accessible for scientists to be able to communicate their research um, using visuals by sort of providing this service um, because sometimes it's, you know, scientists don't really know people that are animators or illustrators um, and obviously some research institutes do have those services but a lot don't so it's nice to be able to pro provide that sort of service. Um, yeah. So um, as John mentioned, I have a background in science, so I did a PhD in um, molecular biology, cancer genetics, so that's sort of my um, area of expertise, I guess, and I've, um, during my PhD, I got interested in sort of using um, art to communicate science, and um, I've done lots of different things around that, and it's sort of, you know, ev evolved, and, and the latest um, project is Square Cell, basically. Um, <coughs> so first let's think about the, the power of using um, visuals to communicate and I'm sure you, I don't need to sort of convince you all but um, this uh, Glendon Mallow from Scientific American um, posed this question of what if all the images went away, what would, what would the world be like? Um, we definitely I guess wouldn't have Instagram or um, Facebook wouldn't be as interesting. Um, so what he did was he, um, so he's a writer and an artist actually, so he edited some um, scientific communication websites um, and removed the images to show that maybe we do actually take for granted the power of using visuals to communicate. Um, so here we've got the Scientific American. Um, I don't know about you, but it's kind of, you don't really know exactly where to look, obviously the title. Um, but it's a little bit sort of, it doesn't um, quite, nothing really jumps out without the images. <coughs> so one, these optical helmets are like fun house mirrors for your face. I guess you can use your imagination as to uh, what that might look like, but um, yeah, obviously an image would have been useful here. <coughs> and lastly, the National Geographic so that title, Phenomena, not exactly rocket science. So it looked like they relied considerably on, on the use of images to um, communicate this idea, whatever it was, we don't actually know. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess this just, just demonstrates that um, we do sort of take it for granted using visuals to communicate in science and that we should probably learn how to do it well. <coughs> um, so there are many benefits to communicating science visually. Um, it can distill complexities into visual narratives. So this um, image on, on my left here was um, created by m the co-founder of Square, Fa uh, Square Cell, Dr. Andrew Liljar, and he um, created this for Tom Oxley, who's a um, neuroscientist um, and entrepreneur and he wanted an image to use for a media release about this new device that he developed called uh, Stendrode. And so the way that um, it's actually in uh, clinical trials at the moment, I believe. And so they, what they do is like a tiny little device, kind of like a stent that can go um, into the brain and they can deliver it through the blood vessels. So you can see the blood vessels are on the, on the image there. Um, which means that um, there's no need for invasive brain surgery, which is obviously always a good thing. Um, and what it can do is that it can capture um, brain signals and translate them into actions. So um, the hope is that um, one day that um, people that are severely paralyzed will be able to use this to um, move their limbs. So yeah, that's kind of the, the basis of what this image is about. 
<coughs> um, it can stimulate deeper thought and questioning, um, and it also engages audiences, so not just scientific peers, but um, you know the public policy makers. It's a really good way to um, get people who might not necessarily have a science background to um, sort of understand what's going on or be more interested to ask more questions. Um, it can actually increase funding opportunities and citations. So there's um, a big sort of movement at the moment where a lot of um, scientific journals are allowing for um, submission of visual abstracts so they can submit um, a summary of their research in a, a sort of a pictorial format and um, then that's used in social media and it's sort of to create a broader reach and a um, broader engagement so um, these um, yeah that's sort of becoming a thing these days um, it can inspire through fascination and wonder and also obviously it can be effortless to um, take in visual communication sometimes um, especially um, when you're trying to navigate a lot of information which we all are these days um, with all of the um, information we're bombarded with and it's it makes things a little bit easier <coughs> so um, what does uh, neuroscience teach us about using visuals to communicate so um, uh, a scientist named Dr. Dr. John Medina asked this question and he um, did some experiments and so I just want to um, do a little poll here so when reading text, how much information do you think we're likely to remember after three days? Do you think it's 10%? Hands up if you think it's 10%. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much everyone in the room. Does anyone think 50%? 65, 87. Yeah, you're right. It's only 10%, so obviously not a lot. Um, how, what about when reading text with a relevant image, how much information do you think we're likely to remember? 10%? 50 percent? 65? 87? <laughs> it's actually 65 percent, yeah. <laughs> Close. Um, yeah, so you can see that obviously um, using images is um, or using visuals in general to um, communicate things means that people are a lot more likely to remember the information that you are teaching them. Um, and this is known as the pictorial superiority effect. So it's just the fact that people remember pictures better than words, basically. Um, <coughs> and this is just in pictorial format, so you remember what I just told you. <laughs> So, um, yeah, how much information we remember depen depends on how the information is delivered. So, yeah, you can see that um, it's a good thing to use visuals in communication. Um, and there's also a lot of research that shows that human memory is extremely sensitive to um, information presented symbolically. So brains love pictures. Um, <coughs> we also know that... Um, it, yeah, it creates more engagement in general, so visuals, um, tweets that have visuals are retweeted 1.5 times more, and it also improves understanding by approximately 89%, which is quite significant. And there's um, this um, author, Maya, I can't remember his first name, he's developed these principles on um, using multimedia um, and visuals in learning, which are quite interesting. <coughs> And finally, we also know the brain processes visuals 60,000 times faster than text. So, safe to say using visuals is a good plan. <coughs> um, we also know that stating facts doesn't always um, work, as we know from many um, skeptics of science and whatnot. Um, but if we can connect with the viewer on, on a more of an emotional level, um, the communication can be more effective <coughs> and they're also more likely to remember if, if they have an emotional connection. Um, so this is just an, uh, an artwork that um, I commissioned when I was working um, as the art director of Lateral Magazine which is a science communication publication where we commission um, artworks to go with the articles that we publish. 
name of the um, article was um, Save Our Plastic Seas, and you can kind of um, instantly see what the article might be about. There's sort of this warrior type person in the ocean collecting um, plastic. And the, the article is about um, some of these, these small grassroots organisations that are working together to try and tackle this um, global problem. Um, <coughs> and another one from the same magazine, um, an article entitled The Unexamined Woman. And so um, this one was about the fact that obviously um, for medical treatments to be um, approved, they have to be tested and whatnot, but basically all of the research is done on men and not women, so um, it, it, this really sort of is negatively um, affects women and, and the, the type of care that they can get. So you can kind of, kind of get that from this image maybe. <coughs> but yeah, you can sort of see that images can be quite powerful at communicating an idea and then get you interested into learning more. <coughs> um, however, if a picture is only worth a thousand words, then we're screwed, according to um, Professor Eric Lander, who was involved in the Human Genome Project. Um, and that's because, obviously, digital content is expanding so quickly um, every year, around a zettabyte, in fact. So that's a lot of data. Um, so yeah, obviously um, we need to have, well we need to be competent and develop ways of um, sort of displaying da data accurately, clearly and concisely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but this does need to be done well, so poorly designed visuals can um, detract from good content and makes data less credible. And conversely, well-designed um, visuals can support content um, and persuade the audience to believe your ideas. So um, on that, let's have a look at this image here. Can anyone um, see anything wrong with this image? You might, if you, if you don't have a science background, you might not know. Exactly, yeah, it's, it's backwards, which um, <laughs> is a pretty bad look for um, a neuroimaging and informatics institute that's just getting launched. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously um, getting some, a, an artist who knows what they're doing and has some training and in, in scientific background is very important in this kind of situation. <laughs> so they got a lot of press for this, but not the type of press that they wanted. So yeah, um, all of these <laughs> um, media outlets were reporting on how they should have got a um, medical illustrator uh, for this. Which, yeah. um, and we also have um, another interesting problem in the world um, in that the way that DNA is depicted. So um, there's, there's a lot of, lot of errors in, in the way that DNA is created um, in images. So um, out of all six of these, there's actually only one that's correct. So we know that, um, so DNA is a double helix structure, as, as you may have heard before, um, and the DNA strands twist around each other, and the way they do that is, called, is known as the handedness. And so basically all, pretty much all DNA um, is right-handed um, twisted. There are some um, forms of DNA that are left-handed, called ZDNA, but they're very rare. So basically all um, DNA, unless it's specifically showing this um, ZDNA, it should be depicted in the right-handed um, turn. So, <coughs> and it also has um, these grooves and about 10.5 base pairs per turn. Um, and so these images are pretty expensive to buy as well. They can be up to $650 each. So if you're paying that much money for something, you'd, wanna, you'd want it to be correct, right? So here you can see on Getty Images, and this, this one is not correct. Um, so <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to try and um, learn how to, how to determine which is the correct way. Im not great images. So there's two ways that you can determine the handedness of DNA. So I'll... Um, 
let's, let's see if we can get you guys to figure out which one's right. Um, so one way is that you can imagine you're walking down a, um, a spiral staircase. If you, um, and if you're turning right down that spiral staircase, you can, uh, you're going, it's a right-handed DNA. That one is a little bit more challenging. So the other way you can do it is identify the strands, um, the orientation of the strand that sort of crosses in front. So the, this is the strand here. <coughs> um, so yeah, the, identify the orientation and if the highest part of the spiral starts at the right and goes down to the left, sort of like a karate chop across the body, then that means it's a right-handed. And if it starts at the left and goes down to the right, that means it's left-handed. So you, you can, you know, pretend to walk down a mini spiral staircase if you like, or you can try this way. Anyone, which, can anyone tell me which one is the right-handed DNA? Yeah, everyone. Everyone thinks one? Yeah, correct. So now you know how to test whether <laughs> a piece of DNA is depicted correctly. <coughs> um, okay, so let's um, look at this case study of um, some research into the Gilboa um, fossil forest. So this um, paleobotanist, Chris Berry, he um, was publishing something and he needed um, an image for the media and so he thought oh, he'll, he'll create his own drawing which is um, what he's done here. Um, it took him about two weeks um, and obviously you know it's, it's not too bad um, but probably not um, publication quality so he thought that um, he might um, hire someone to oh, he might hire someone to um, do a professional illustration, which um, turned into this. And then, um, as you can see, there's, the quality is quite um, significantly different. Um, and he ended up getting that on the cover of Nature, which is one of the um, top science journals. So um, he sort of learnt the, the value of hiring someone that actually has some, some scientific um, illustration training. Um, <coughs> so science trained artists are um, in high demand, so this is a, a figure from the Association of Medical Illustrators and you can see that um, the demand is sort of in academic research, publishing and sort of clinical education. Um, <coughs> and there are many um, skills required. Um, for to become a scientific artist, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so there's um, the artistic sk skills, so illustration, animation, all of that. Well, that's not very... Um, can't see the text very well. There's design, so graphic design, marketing, presentations, all of that kind of thing. And then um, <laughs> what we call sorcery, which is all of the other stuff, programming, coding, obviously all you guys probably know all about this anyway. Um, and then of course there's all the scientific um, training b before you sort of learn all of that. So there's the um, you know, highly skilled um, and not actually very easy to find. And so um, myself and my um, co-founder of Square Cell, Andrew Liljar, um, we, throughout um, sort of our careers, we have been lucky enough to meet lots of people that are in this area, so that's um, sort of how we um, decided to create Square Cell, which is sort of like a visual um, science um, communication collective, so a range of different science artists, um, as we mentioned, and this is um, Andrew here. So he's, um, he actually is a full-time biomedical animator um, at the 3D Visual Aesthetics Lab in the University of New South Wales. Um, and yeah, so we met each other um, doing our PhDs. These are all the artists that we um, have on, on our team who um, create the beautiful artwork for us. Um, and these are just some of the examples of the types of things they can do, the, the still images. So we have 2D and 3D images. 
Um, <coughs> and we also obviously have animation. So I'll show you this um, in a second. So um, we use um, sort of the industry standard 3D animation programs like um, Maya and Cinema 4D. Um, and, you know, we can sort of import um, scientific data into, um, there's a plugin called Molecular Maya where you can use, yeah, like protein structures that have been determined from scientific research, import it into the um, program and then, yeah, obviously model and create these um, fantastic animations. So I'll just show you, um, this is just very sort of short animations and to sort of compare with um, non-scientific um, animation as well. So you can see sort of it's the same program, um, similar effects are used, but a very different outcome, obviously. And I, I hear that there are some animators uh, in Sensi Lab, so you might be familiar with these programs. Um, is it going to start? So this is by um, Shenai, our, one of our artists. There was going to be sound, but it didn't work. So you can see the layering and the effects. We can look at cell division. And then obviously this is not um, scientific, but <laughs> just to show the, the difference and, you know, using the same program and getting more sort of blockbuster Hollywood effects. <coughs> Definitely is cooler with sound, but that's all right. So yeah, obviously we can do cool things with these programs. <coughs> um, <coughs> this one here um, is an example of where specific protein structures have been imported into, into um, Maya and then, so this is obviously an animation that is used by a scientist to talk to other scientists about um, about a particular process. So this is actually about um, the scarring process, um, which um, has evolved to be fast, but not perfect. So they're trying to investigate um, exactly how the scarring process actually works. So then they can potentially um, <coughs> modify it um, to um, result in better healing of, of sort of organs, basically. Um, so yeah, you can, they've determined all of the protein structures that are involved in this. And yeah, so all of these protein structures were, have been determined through scientific research. So we know that they're all accurate. And yeah. And then just a couple more um, animation styles that we do. is an educational video so you can import um, all of the these structures as well anatomical structures <coughs> obviously this 2d animation as well a lot more basic if if required you know different people have different requirements of what they need there's that one again creepy little humans or little monsters. 
Um, yep, yeah, so. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of these um, animations and illustrations is to facilitate a broader understanding of these scientific con uh, concepts to the intended audience. And so um, recently we developed an animation for um, the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute. Um, and it was around uh, a therapy that they'd developed for um, aggress aggressive blood cancers. So um, when just a couple of days after we'd finished the animation, actually the um, TGA, which is the um, the organisation that sort of accepts therapies for use in humans um, accepted this, um, it was called CAR T cells, so there was a lot of press around it um, and it got published in um, SBS News and on, on Seven News on the TV and so they had the animation to um, go alongside these news articles which was very helpful um, for actually explaining how that therapy worked and that um, helped actually improve the quality of the coverage of the, f of the discovery because the, um, the reporters were able to watch the animation and understand how, you know, how the therapy worked and then they were able to sort of communicate it more effectively than um, they probably normally would have apparently. So this is the, the feedback that we got from Peter Mack which was really nice. Um, and they also, um, this is just a screenshot here, they also use it in their um, patient education, so for people that are um, going to be um, taking the therapy basically, they can understand how it works and what it's actually doing. Um, and this is another one that we, um, a 3D image that we produced which was published in um, the Science um, Journal, which is again one of another one of the big journals for science, um, and also made it into the news. And this one was about um, uh, something about organ <coughs> transplants and so the um, there's a virus that um, people uh, when they get organ transplants are more susceptible to so this was a therapy that was going to prevent um, basically that virus from infecting patients as much um, and another way that we um, sort of try to work with scientists to um, use visuals to sort of <laughs> to um, create engagement with their researchers that we um, have been giving visual um, communication skills workshops to sort of teach them the basics of, of why using visuals is important, um, give them resources and sort of um, sort of things that they, tools they can use to actually do it themselves and, and really get, um, yeah, get more people into this kind of um, communication. And so I'm sure you're all wondering why are we called square cell? <laughs> so um, we knew that our main clients would probably be um, scientists, so we wanted to have um, the word cell in there because it's sort of the most recognisable name and we wanted the scientists to recognise it. Um, but um, a cell, as you probably all know, is also an integral component of a digital image. So we know that an image is um, sort of a cohesive organisation of much smaller units that make up the image um, and then that is obviously called a pixel. So the pixel is a very small square cell as you can see down there and that is why we're called square cell. And that's all I have to say today so thank you for listening. Time for a question or two. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. That was fascinating. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering about, you know, as a collective of artists, I'm just curious, like, so who, when, when they're taking up a, a job for a magazine or perhaps it's a medical organ, who kind of pays the most for images and, you know, what are the kind of ranges of hours some of these people have worked? I'm very interested because this is something some of my students have expressed interest in. Oh, right, okay. Years, yeah. Right. Um, well, it definitely depends what it is. So, obviously, yeah. 3D animations probably take the longest. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're 
we're creating, we've got a project at the moment for um, New South Wales Health and they have um, a lot of money to put towards education so we're developing some um, animations for them and that project is sort of like a, a whole year project so many hours. Um, we have one lead animator and then um, Andrew, my co-founder, is sort of doing smaller, smaller parts. Um, uncountable amount of hours, I couldn't really say um, at this point. Whereas, um, you know, a, a 3D um, illustration that could take maybe a month, but not sort of maybe not full time, but... Um, and there's feedback between... Exactly, yeah, there's always, sure, yeah, there's always a lot of feedback going on in between. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a process. Um, but yeah, it, it just really depends what it is. And so actually the um, individual scientists are probably the ones that have the least amount of money. Yes, <laughs> and like they, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so because, you know, it's, it's not something that they would probably consider putting into their grant applications, for example, um, even though I think that might be coming more um, common now. It's sort of... You know, you, you don't sort of realise that you want it until you need it, and then it's it's too late by then. So it it, it depends, you know, if if your um, university is willing to put in money, um, yeah. But um, definitely, um, we have had um, some, you know, pharmaceutical companies. Obviously, they have money. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but you you I mean. So the is it generally the larger the larger the corporation or government body the bigger and more expensive the project. It, se it yeah. seems that way, yep. yes. Yep. It does depend slightly, but yeah, in general, yeah. Yep. And yeah, like animators can get paid quite well, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned artists, so you have those groups of people as a business. You, they are not allocated with you, right? They no, they work as contractors, exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's sort of why. Um, for us, it, it works quite well because we don't need a physical space. Everyone sort of works in their own space. They have their own facilities and that sort of thing. So yeah, that, I mean, and I work full time as well as um, Andrew. So, you know, we sort of do this in between um, and we, we make it manageable because for that reason, um, because yeah, we've got that flexibility. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you, you showed the example of the brain ran the wrong way as being obvious yeah. um, state. I was kind of interested in um, so a lot of the molecular visualizations, for instance. Mm. There's a lot of assumptions and yeah. things yeah. like you, know, you can't represent color at the molecular level of the mole you know the molecules are shown as spheres and yeah. those kinds of things. So where do you draw the line on? Do you do you ever sort of think about that? Like because people have this, you know, they see. Um, Molecular visualizations, for example, mm. and they see colors and they see spheres and things like that, and so they kind of think, "Oh, yeah, okay, that's what a molecule is. It's like a sphere." Yeah, mm. yeah. And is that, there's those microscopy images, pollen and stuff that are colored, beautiful, mm. or pastel colors, which, yeah. Yeah, which, which obviously really. is not so they, reality. They're, they're yeah. great for yeah. newsworthy, you know. So yeah. the news editor says, "Oh, that's a cool yeah. image." So how much? How much do you? Where do you draw the line? I guess is what I'm mm. asking. Yeah, and that, that's a good question. And I guess, I mean, when you are depicting things like this, obviously you need you need contrast and you need colour to be able to show differences and that kind of thing. So I think that kind of outweighs the, the fact that it's not reality, even though obviously it's not ideal. I mean, if, if you have a, a better suggestion. <laughs> well, no, I don't. But I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm curious as to what, if, if you get different feedback from, like if you have a scientist, mm. so my understanding is... Um, no, earlier before we were talking about Drew Berry, so I remember Drew told me a story of, I think it was one of the Nobel Prize winning scientists oh, yeah. came and saw his thing and said he hated it because it was so inaccurate and oh, right, you know, yeah. it was really negative about it. Okay. Then another, the sounds in it. The, the sound, the, you know, the put sounds oh, sound yes, on yes. it. Mm -hmm. the molecules would bump into each other and then make a sound. Yep. But that was part of the, the that was part of the, the world he was trying to convey. Yeah, but then, but then other, yeah. other molecular biologists you know, would say this is, you know, never been enough to imagine this, this how, you know, you see, so, you know, he had that famous animation of the sort of molecular part of the DNA um, creating proteins, like it's like, and it really looks like a mesh ratcheting along the, yep, the yeah, sequence. Yeah, yeah, cool one, yeah. So, um, uh, I'm wondering if sci are scientists more critical about those? They can be, yeah, yeah, and that's sort of something that you have to sort 
work with during the feedback process um, if they don't think you know, the colour reflects um, how it should, then yeah, we, we definitely would um, change that based on, on what they feel. Um, but yeah, it is, it is sort of a, a fine balance of mm. getting that right, for sure. Mm. There's also, there's a whole history of scientific illustration that obviously goes back mm. hundreds of years or thousands definitely, of Definitely, yeah. And in various, you know, you look, at, you look at scientific illustration at various periods and often when it was done by artists, it has these kind of artistic qualities that mm -hmm. almost the unique signature Style mm, for sure. Do, do, you, do you, the artists who you work with, do they think about those things or do they try and sort of, you know, modern scientific visualisation has this sort of generic -y kind of look and it's largely maybe due to the software, like you're using mm. 3D animation software. Yep. Do, you ever, do you ever think about could we have a more loose artistic interpretation of this that becomes more like an artwork that's memorable? Yeah, but yeah. It's also maybe less. Maybe or yeah, yeah, we do for sure. Um, but yeah, I think it does depend on on the client and what they want. Um, obviously, ultimately, we have to we have to do what they want. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we it is it is considered, and especially like you know when designing sort of um, covers for journal articles, they can be a bit more sort of artistic because they are meant to be striking and memorable. Yeah. But for something like, you know, that animation that I showed you with the different protein structures, that one obviously needs to be quite accurate. Sort of yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it depends what, what it's for as well, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so do, uh, in, in your collective, do, I know obviously the artists come from all kinds of backgrounds, but mm. do a lot of them have interests in science, medicine, perhaps a double degree, or are they just really good animators or illustrators who say, yeah, I'll do this. Uh, no, they, they, well, they do all have, like, scientific training, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just interested in what I like, think scientific training that is. I'm just I'm curious about it because it's a really... It's mm, so some of them um, will be, yeah. like, PhD students, for example. Some mm -hmm. of them um, have got masters. A couple of them just have undergraduate. Um, and so there's, I think, there's a plant biologist. They've, they're quite, um, there's quite a range, yep. so there is someone who's a molecular biologist. Um, so they're often science or, or yeah, so they're more experts first and, and It seems that way, yeah. They sort of well. teach themselves these extra skills because right. they, I think maybe they feel like they're not getting that enough in the scientific world, so they, um, yeah, go, go in this route, yeah. It's really interesting. Mm, yeah, it is. But obviously, you know, science is creative and it, it's really nice to be able to combine the two in this in this way. Mm. Great. Okay. Any more questions? Good. All right. Well, let's thank Nikki once again. Thank you so thank much you. for coming out. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming too. Yeah. Thank you.